Continuing our studies in the book of Romans, and this morning we are finishing Romans chapter 9. Our text is verses 25 through 33. <clears throat> Last week we left off with the statement in verse 24 that God has called not only people from among the Jews, but also from among Gentiles. And that calls for some support from Scripture, and that's what Paul now gives in verse 25. He writes, as he says, also in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in that place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. For the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. And just as Isaiah foretold, Unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left to us a posterity, we would have become like Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Before I pray, I want to read one more text that I think gives a quick, easy summary of what we've been studying in Romans 9. And it's from 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9, but I'll begin with verse 8. He encourages young Timothy. He says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which He granted in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Why are we saved? It's not because of our works. It's in spite of our works. We can't be saved by our works. It's according to God's purpose and His grace, which He granted to us. When? From all eternity. Well, that's Romans chapter 9. It's an odd fact that many scientific discoveries were made by accident. Scientists weren't pursuing them. Quinine for malaria, penicillin for infections, insulin for diabetes, all were accidents. Other scientific pursuits were attempts to discover a special thing, and they were failures. Isaac Newton, for example, spent years practicing alchemy, trying to turn lead into gold. He pursued a myth. What is true in science is true in religion. Israel pursued salvation by law keeping, which is like trying to turn lead into gold, while Gentiles who weren't seeking salvation, found it. It was an accident of grace. Paul saw this in his ministry when he preached Christ to the Gentiles. They turned from idols to believe in him and be justified. But when he entered synagogues, the Jews rejected Jesus. It is surprising because God promised salvation to the Jews. And yet they didn't believe. They, they didn't arrive at it. Why is that? Well, that's what Paul asks. Had God's promise failed? Had God failed? 
That's the question that Paul answers in this chapter. And of course, God's word can never fail. God is true. God, God's promises are always kept. It is impossible, as Paul wrote in Titus, for God to lie. God's promises were never intended for every physical Israelite. In verse 8, Paul said, It is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise, children of grace. God's promises were never intended for all of those who were circumcised. Those who received the promise of salvation are those who were chosen out of mercy and mercy alone. His elect ones. Now, is that unfair for him to choose some and not others? No, it's not unfair to do that. In fact, all through this chapter, Paul has been demonstrating that this doctrine of election is true. To the Jew and now to the Gentile, he will explain that. This is God's work. It is a work of mercy, but it's God's prerogative to do that. God's prerogative to choose. But also, as I say, election is all of grace. Because apart from election, and we must understand this, apart from it, no one would be saved because no one seeks. Now, if you're new to the study of the book of Romans and you've just joined us way back at the beginning of this book, Paul laid the foundation for the things that I've just said. He gives a long introduction to the book, but then in verse 18 of chapter 1, he talks about the Gentiles and how unworthy they are and how guilty they are, which the Jews would have said amen to. But then in chapter 2, he takes on the Jews to explain that the Jews are equally guilty and unworthy. And then in the first half of chapter 3, up through chapter verse 20, and really to verse 23, he makes the point that all mankind is guilty. All have sinned. That is mankind. Mankind is unworthy. And so that we would be saved at all is quite a mercy of God, a great miracle of grace. So Paul speaks of the vessels of mercy. And many of those that he calls vessels of mercy are Israelites. But in addition to that, and in order to show the riches of his grace, God has also chosen many Gentiles to receive salvation. Paul said that in verse 24. We looked at that when we began our reading this morning. He says, Who, uh, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. Now, that would have been hard for a Jew to accept and certainly to believe that God had chosen the Gentiles, the dogs, to receive his blessing and be numbered among his people. You get a sense of that, for example, in Acts chapters 21 and 22, events that occurred after Paul had written the book of Romans. He went back to Jerusalem to deliver a gift to the suffering Jews there, and specifically the church in Jerusalem. And he visited the temple, and while he was there, some Asian Jews, Greek-speaking Jews, saw him, remembered him from Asia and, and Ephesus and the great ministry that he had there, and they pointed out this great enemy of Israel. Paul is here, and he's brought Gentiles with him. And so a mob formed, they grabbed him, and they took him outside or on their way to take him outside of the temple to put him to death when the Romans intervened and saved his life. And the commander, when he found out he wasn't a revolutionary, gave him permission to speak to the Jews, and he did. He gave them his testimony. He described himself as a Jew, a Pharisee, uh, studied under Gamaliel, and was a persecutor of the church. But then on his way to Damascus, God, Christ appeared to him in a great light, and he was saved goes to Damascus, he's baptized. And all through this, they're listening intently to what he had to say until he says at the end, Jesus said to him that he was to go far away to the Gentiles. And then the crowd erupted in anger. They said away with him, they wanted his death. 
Oh, that's the attitude of the Jew at that time in Paul's day toward Gentiles. Well, Paul says that they are also among those whom God has chosen. And so in the next verses, verses 25 through 29, Paul gives proof of that. He gives it in a series of quotes from the Old Testament to support the fact that God has indeed called Gentiles to salvation. It's in the Scripture. First he quotes from the book of Hosea, which is the great love story of the Old Testament to support this fact. It's the book that speaks of God's compassion and mercy for the undeserving. In verse 25 he quotes Hosea chapter 2 verse 23 where God gives the promise of restoration. As he says also in Hosea, I will call those who are not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, beloved. And then in verse 26, he quotes Hosea chapter 1 and verse 10 with the same meaning, the same point. And it shall be that, that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Now, this is actually a promise for Israel. Israel had sinned and been cut off, but the nation would someday be restored and brought back into God's favor. But Paul interpreted these prophecies as applying to the Gentiles because God's calling of Gentiles works on the same principle as will His restoration of Israel. If Jews had been cut off from God in judgment, could once again be brought in to a place of favor and salvation, then God could certainly call Gentiles to be His people. Those who are not His people to be called His people. And that's certainly what Paul had witnessed in his ministry. He'd seen this very thing with great numbers of Gentiles being saved. Those who were not called His people, those who were obviously rejected, were being called His people. So He made the application of the prophecy to them. Those who truly were not His people were the people of God. That's God's mercy. And as I said a moment ago, that is a great miracle of God's grace. And it shows the vastness of God's grace, the width, the breadth, the depth of it, that He would save even Gentiles. But what about those who had been called sons of God, those of Israel? Most of the Jews of Paul's day had not believed the gospel. They had rejected it. They had rejected Christ. They had rejected their Messiah. What did the Scripture say about that? And in verses 27 and 28, Paul tells us. He quotes Isaiah, who predicted their failure and the exclusion of all but a small number from those who would be saved. This, by the way, answers the Jewish question that if, if Jesus were the Christ, well, the Jewish people would have recognized that and they would have accepted Him. The fact that they rejected Him shows that He's not the Christ. No, not at all. Scripture shows that the majority of Israel has always been in unbelief and rebellion. Verse 27, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. For the Lord will execute His word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. God's promises have always been for the remnant, the elect, those that God chose for salvation. Paul gives a second quote from Isaiah in verse 29. It's from Isaiah chapter 1 verse 9. And again, it's about judgment and mercy. Unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left to us a posterity, we would have become like Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. Nobody survived the destruction of those cities other than Lot and his daughters. They were sinful cities, and their judgment is what Israel deserved. In fact, in the next verse, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 10, he likens the leaders of Jerusalem to those of Sodom. In fact, as you read through Isaiah and Ezekiel, you read the prophets, 
often they compare or call Jerusalem and the cities of Judah Sodom and Gomorrah. Nothing occurred in Sodom and Gomorrah that didn't happen in Jerusalem or the cities of Judah. And so what that tells us is it's only because of the sovereign grace of God that even a remnant was left. Otherwise, the entire nation would have been completely wiped out just as those cities of the plain were destroyed. But God is the Lord Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, meaning the Lord of the armies. He controls the powers of the universe and determines the course of history and ensures that His chosen ones will be preserved and saved. In fact, that's the only reason we are saved. The only reason anyone in this auditorium is saved and has a glorious future is because of God's choice, His sovereign election. So the doctrine of election, far from being harsh or unfair, is the opposite. Apart from vessels prepared beforehand for mercy, we would all perish. We would all be fitted for destruction. The Jews of Paul's day didn't understand that, which is an irony. The chosen people, God's chosen people, didn't understand God's choice. They felt secure because they were descendants of Abraham. But the Bible gives no grounds for such security. It's a false security. It is spiritual Israel, believing Israel within physical Israel, God's elect that will be saved. And that is a remnant. But a remnant is also a sign of hope. It's like a down payment, as it were. It's the assurance that the good things are coming. It's an assurance that God is not finished with the Jewish people. In the future, the nation will return to the Lord. In fact, all that we're studying here in, in chapters 9, 10, and 11 is moving toward that great statement in Romans 11, verse 26, the promise, all Israel will be saved. It is in this way that Paul reconciles the promises of God to Israel with the small number that are presently being saved from among the Jews. It's, it's a way of God demonstrating and saying that He's not finished. He's not finished with His chosen people, with the nation Israel, and He's presently being faithful to them just as He is faithful to us. The lessons from this are important. First, that God's Word is true. It can be trusted. In fact, Israel's failure is proof of that. Th this is what was prophesied centuries earlier. If we're, if we're surprised by this, what Paul is showing is this was prophesied. And it's happened. And the fact that it's happened is proof that God's Word is true. Now that's one lesson, but secondly, this is, uh, gives us a lesson against presumptuousness, against the, uh, the, the, um, the idea that, uh, that man is not responsible and that man can, can, um, can, can live on a false security that's not given in the Word of God. It's a, it's a lesson against unbelief and a reminder that man's responsible to believe the Word of God and not rest in false assurances. Well, that's what Paul comes to in the last verses of the chapter where he lays great stress on God's absolute sovereignty and salvation. Robert Haldane, a Scottish commentator of almost... 200 years ago, wrote a classic commentary on the book of Romans, and in it he stated, can anything be more palpably obvious than the meaning of the apostle? Is there any chapter in the Bible more plain in its grammatical meaning? Well, I don't think so. <clears throat> I was, said something similar to that last week, that uh, <clears throat> the problem that people have with Romans chapter 9 
is not that this book is so, this chapter is obscure and it's, it's so deep and it's, it's difficult to fathom. It's not it at all. It's not hard to understand. As Haldane pointed out, the innate aversion of the mind to its humbling truths is the, is the issue. We don't like what we read here. It's not that we don't understand it. It's that people don't like what they do understand because it eliminates all merit and boasting. But divine sovereignty in, in salvation and judgment is clearly stated here. It's clearly stated here. What we need to realize, though, as well, is that human responsibility is also assumed here. And the two issues, the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man, are not incompatible with each other. God is sovereign, but man is responsible. Paul emphasizes that in the remaining verses, verses 30 through 33, where he explains that Israel bears responsibility for not receiving the salvation that was prophesied and promised to it. Paul begins the subject with a question. What shall we say then? What are we to make of, of Israel's unbelief, especially in light of Gentile salvation? They weren't even seeking it. The Gentiles, when they found it, while Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. They were working, and they were working hard, but they were working in the wrong direction. In Jerusalem, there is a bridge, a pedestrian bridge over a road in what was a new part of the city when it was pointed out to me 30 years ago. It's a fine bridge, concrete, well built, but no one uses it. The, the bridge was built as a, at a very busy intersection in this section of the city and was built to be over the, busy, the busiest street so that people wouldn't have to wait at the light. They could just walk over this intersection. But the bridge isn't used because it was built over a quiet side street and not the intersection or the, the street it was intended for. Someone wasn't paying attention to the blueprints or the purpose. And that was Israel's problem and its religion. They thought it was a bridge to heaven. Lots of work went into it. But the reality is it was a bridge to nowhere. If they paid attention to the blueprint, if they paid attention to Scripture, they might have known that salvation is by grace. The Scriptures teach that. Paul builds his gospel that he presents here in the book of Romans on the Old Testament texts. And one of them is Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, which states, The just shall live by faith. There it is in their prophets. Salvation is by grace through faith. Now that's how Paul answers the question in verse 32. He asks, why did Israel not arrive at the righteousness they pursued? It's because they pursued it in the wrong way, by works, not by faith. The, the law was given <clears throat> to expose our need of righteousness. The law was never given as a means of salvation. It wasn't given to save us. It was given to show us that we can't be saved, that we can't save ourselves by our works or our deeds. It was given to show us that we need a Savior. But the Jewish people as a whole read it differently. They saw salvation as something they could achieve by the works of the law. And they attempted it in that way. They refused to see what the scriptures teach. And so Paul explains that they did not arrive because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They took the wrong path. They spent their energy in the wrong way. That's not just a Jewish problem. It's a human problem. It's the error of religion. 
which is man's attempt to earn God's acceptance by his own works, by his own deeds, by ceremonies, by the things that he or she does. It's a, a bridge to God. But sin has so separated man from God, and we need to understand the seriousness of sin. It is so grave, it is so great that it has created such a gulf between man and God, such a gulf between heaven and earth, that we cannot cross it. Impossible. Only God can supply that bridge, and He has done that. He's done that in His Son, in the work of His Son, His death and faith in Him. That is what the Gentiles found when they weren't seeking it. It wasn't a mere accident. It wasn't uh, some truth that they happened to stumble upon. It's what God brought them to. They weren't seeking Him, but He was seeking them. It's all of grace, sovereign and free grace. They were lost, and He found them. Well, once again, could that be an excuse for Israel's unbelief? After all, if God elects some and passes others by, those passed over can't be blamed for their failure to believe, can they? We've seen this objection already in verse 19 about Pharaoh, and Paul's answer is, yes, they can be blamed. Yes, they're responsible. Election is not an excuse for unbelief. God doesn't condemn innocent people. We need to understand that. God is, is not looking over this fallen race and sees some who really want to believe and who understand and would, would, would know that, that this Christ is the Savior, but God just passes them by, isn't interested in them. What we, we've already said and what Paul has established very clearly in the first part of the book of Romans is we're guilty, all of us. All have sinned. None deserve God's grace. God is not obliged to show mercy to rebels. That He does at all is nothing short of miraculous. And that, we would that He would choose Gentiles of all people is really an amazing display of His grace. We weren't seeking Him when He sought us, opened our minds to understand the truth and believe. Now that is a reason for joy and thanksgiving. It's not a reason for consternation and angst and argument. This is something to rejoice in. This is amazing grace. And still, people struggle with that, and they, they, they argue that if it, it's all dependent on God and predestination and election, then we're just puppets without wills of our own, and condemnation under such circumstances is not just. Well, that's a false argument. People do have wills, and they are responsible. We are not puppets. And the doctrines of God's sovereign grace do not hinder, do not hinder human freedom. The decisions that people make are freely made. God doesn't force people to receive the truth. God doesn't force people to reject the truth. People act and choose according to their natural inclinations. But as a result of the fall, our entire being, our mind, our body, our will, everything has been so affected by sin that the bent of our nature is always naturally from God, away from God. We will always choose contrary to His will. That is human nature. Paul already brought that out earlier in chapter 8. You remember verse 7 where he speaks of the natural mind. This is the unbelieving mind, the unregenerate mind. He said, it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. It's in rebellion, and it's not able to not be in rebellion. For anyone to do so, to, to cease rebelling, 
anyone to subject himself or herself to the law of God, to the will of God, God must first intervene and change their heart. And in his mercy, he does that. But when he doesn't, when he leaves people in their natural condition, which, by the way, is what they want to be, that's the natural desire that they have to be left in that condition. When they are, they're responsible for what they do. Look, you and I may not fully understand how the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man fit together. Paul doesn't explain it completely. But what is clear is people are responsible. People reject the gospel not because it is confusing. You can listen to unbelievers, professors in seminaries who reject the truth, who can explain the gospel very clearly. They understand the gospel. They know what the gospel is about. And they can give it. They don't reject it because it's so confusing and hard to understand. It's because they don't like it. And they don't want it. And they don't believe that it's true. It's foolishness to them. And so they knowingly, freely refuse it. Israel rejected Christ freely. At the end of verse 32 and in verse 33, Paul speaks of that. He refers to the Lord as the stone of stumbling. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Verse 33, just as, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Israel missed Christ because it didn't look for him. He, he was foretold in Scripture, but the nation focused on the requirements of the law rather than the person who is the focus of the law. Israel was like a, a, a person walking down a path and is looking down the length of that path and is looking at something distant but is not paying attention to what is right at his feet. And there's a stone that he stumbles over. Now that's Israel. So because Israel failed to believe in Christ, he who was to be a great blessing for the nation became instead the cause of the nation's downfall. He was Israel's stumbling stone. The, uh, the image of, of Christ as the stone is a common one in the Old Testament. We find it, for example, in Genesis 49, Verse 24, right at the very beginning of the Bible, where the Lord is described as the shepherd, the stone of Israel. In other words, the Lord is a reliable guide and protector. He is a shepherd. He's faithful, but he's also a rock. He is a firm and solid foundation. He is always dependable. He is never shaken. We can build our lives on him, the shepherd and the stone. But instead of building on him as the chief cornerstone, as the valuable stone that determines the, the character of the temple, of the nation itself, Israel rejected him. And that was prophesied. Paul shows that in verse 33 with quotes from Isaiah. Isaiah 28, verse 16, and Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14. God said that he laid the stone in Zion. It means he sent his son to his people. But Israel did not recognize him as a costly stone, did not recognize him as the foundation of their lives. They stumbled, and they stumbled for various reasons. They stumbled on his deity. In John chapter 10 and verse 33, we read that the, the Jews picked up stones to stone him because they said, you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. He made it clear that he's no mere man. He is God incarnate. And they rejected that. He was just a man to them, just a common stone in the path. They saw nothing of value in him. After all, he came in a common way. He came in a very natural way. He didn't come on a bolt of lightning or 
in some shower of gold, the way the Greeks would speak of God's appearing. He came as a helpless babe born to poor parents in an insignificant corner of the Roman Empire. He became a carpenter. He lived among the poor of the land. He was not attractive to them. But then again, Isaiah prophesied that in the servant passages of Isaiah 53 and others. 53 verses 2 and 3, we read, He was like a root out of dry ground. He, was no, he has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon Him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to Him. And so Isaiah concludes, He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. His deity caused them to stumble. His humanity caused them to stumble. And His words caused them to stumble. He called men to believe in Him, to trust in Him. He stood up in the temple in John chapter 7 on a great day of the feast, and He said, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to Me and drink. When the people heard that, they were divided over Him. And some of them wanted to seize Him, and put Him to death. Again in the temple in the next chapter, in John chapter 8, he said, I am the light of the world. And the Pharisees rejected that. Your testimony is not true, they said. His claims and his teaching offended them. He proclaimed that salvation is in him only. It's through faith in him. It's not in the law. But as Paul says, they were pursuing righteousness not by faith, but by works. So they stumbled over him. Because grace, not merit, free salvation offends people's pride. In fact, Christ taught that uh, we are helpless to come to him. People don't like to hear that, but he taught that directly. In John chapter 6 and verse 44, he told the crowds, large crowd in Galilee, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. You cannot come unless God draws you to him. So, we are responsible to come to Christ for salvation, but we cannot do that unless God first draws us. That's God's sovereignty in election, in the new birth, in irresistible grace, in faith. The people stumbled over that. In fact, in that particular occasion, speaking to that large group, it was after he said these things that they said, these are too hard, and they left. People don't want God on his throne. They don't want to be in his debt. But we are, and salvation is only through Christ because he has paid our debt. The Son of God visited his people and when he did, they were blessed. The people who were sitting in darkness, Isaiah prophesied, saw a great light. And as I said, they were blessed by his presence, by his teaching, by his miracles, by him. But they rejected that light. They wanted a conquering king, not a suffering savior. The cross, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 23, is a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Again, this is not simply a Jewish problem. This is a problem of human nature. Only grace can save. But we're responsible. Paul puts sovereignty and responsibility side by side. Dr. Johnson put it simply. He said, we are saved by divine grace, but we are lost by reason of our sin. Israel sinned. It was without excuse. It was blessed with privileges. Paul began this chapter in the first five verses listing the, the blessings and the privileges that Israel had. It had the scriptures but it didn't read them correctly, certainly didn't obey them. But then, do we? Not always. James Boyce pointed that out in a convicting way in his study on this passage. He wrote, 
You know what God says about following Him, for example, about seeking first His kingdom and His righteousness, knowing that all these things, food, clothing, the necessities of life, and other good things will be given to you. We know that. We've read that. We're familiar with that. We believe it's true. But do we rest in it? Do we really rely upon it? Do we really follow it? Or do we get tired of those things and the things of God and begin to follow our own interests and our own inclinations? We do that. And we get cold. We drift spiritually. And then trouble comes and we wonder why. God declares, those who honor me I will honor, but those who despise me will be disdained or lightly esteemed, as the New American Standard Bible puts it. So there is an important lesson here. Again, we mentioned this, mentioned it earlier, but the important lesson, first one is, study God's Word. Study it. Don't just study it and read it. Trust it. Believe it. Even when it's difficult, know that it is true and rest in it. And God clears up the problems as we continue our studies. But there's another lesson, a warning, and that is against the sin of presumptuousness, of spiritual conceit. Israel was confident in its position and ability. They were descendants of Abraham. They had the law. They had the covenants. They had circumcision. They knew they were okay. Professing Christians can be guilty of that same conceit. It, conceit. it may be for different reasons, but it's the same thing. They've been baptized. They, they've grown up in the church. They've taken the Lord's Supper. They heard the Bible taught. They know the stories. They know all the hymns. They can sing them. They're okay, aren't they? But salvation has nothing to do with biology or heredity, with uh, associations or formal membership, not even with reading the Bible, if we read it incorrectly, or if we don't pay attention to it. After all, Israel had the Bible. It's about believing what is in the Bible, believing the gospel, which means it is all about grace. That is so clear from verse 30. Gentiles were not pursuing righteousness and found it. It's the same for everyone, Jew and Gentile alike, everyone who is saved. We weren't seeking the Lord. We were living for the world when at some point, whether when we were children or whether we were in adults, but in God's time, He reached down into our hearts. He shined the light within our hearts and He called us. That's what He did for you. When you had no thought of Him, he thought of you. He had thought of you from all eternity. And then one day he called you and he made an unwilling person willing. And you believed. That sovereign grace, free grace, it begins in the heart of God, in his decree of election. It is unconditional election. It does not depend upon us, it depends upon Him, and it does not keep anyone out of heaven. It opens heaven to the undeserving. That's the teaching of the Bible. It should make us happy. It should make us thankful. It's the only way we can be saved. After all, Israel pursuing a law of righteousness did not arrive. Isaiah gave the gospel here at the end of the text. He who believes in him will not be disappointed. Have you done that? Or do you think that, that a righteousness of your own making is good enough? It's not. If it were, Israel would have achieved. It would have arrived. But Israel is the great proof that it cannot, we cannot be saved by our works. If anyone could have been saved by religion or character, it was the Jews. And they did not arrive. Don't trust in yourself. Trust in Christ and His sacrifice alone. He does not disappoint. Well, why don't we conclude with one of the great hymns of the faith, one of my favorite hymn, 104 in the Red Book. Come thou fount, and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn 104.